Let's take our Bibles tonight and let's turn to Acts chapter 26, please. Acts chapter number 26. Acts chapter 26. It's been a few weeks since we were last here in these verses. And uh, I've told you all a few times, I've preached three, message out of, three messages out of here so far. This will, Lord will, and be the last one. I said that, the, I think I said that two times ago. And uh, so, it's been, so I've lied a couple of times. But no, I said Lord willing. So the Lord hadn't been willing yet. But I think, uh, Lord willing, tonight will be the last message that we spend here. Uh, but as I've said, um, the more time you spend in any portion of Scripture, you're going to realize it is inexhaustible. Uh, you cannot get to the bottom of it. You spend more time here, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and so at some point, I have to learn to stop studying. All right? Sometimes you just got to learn. I got... There's enough on that message. Go study something else. Because uh, if I stay here any longer, we'll be here three more weeks. Uh, because And it is also one of my favorite portions of Scripture, as I've told y'all. Um, I love uh, Acts 26 because it is, to me, one of the clearest examples of one person sharing their faith with somebody else. It, it, it's, I mean, it's, it's clear. It's detailed. You get to get to listen in on the conversation. So many times in the ministry of the Apostle Paul, we don't get to listen to the conversation. We find Paul shows up in a town, and then there's converts. Uh, but you know, that didn't just happen by him walking in the, the city limits, right? When he, when he crosses in to, uh, to Thessalonica or whatever, it's not just a bunch of people just automatically get saved because he's there. It's not osmosis. Uh, I mean, he has to actually converse with them, to share the gospel with them, to testify to them. And so this is a wonderful example of one time in which we actually do get the details, the, the, the actual uh, recorded conversation of what happened in this instance. As I've told you, Paul is in Caesarea. Um, he has been, uh, he, the Jews are trying to kill him, and so they brought him before these different Roman uh, rulers to try to see him killed. He stands before Festus, or Felix, and then he moves and stands before another judge named Festus. While he's talking to Festus in Acts chapter 25, he appeals to Caesar. He says, I want to be seen by Caesar. And so he's put in hold. He's, he's waiting to go see Caesar. And then Agrippa shows up and Festus tells Agrippa about Paul. And then he says, well, I'd like to hear him. Uh, and so that's when Acts chapter 26 picks up with this, this hearing of Agrippa by uh, the, the apostle Paul. And he's going to tell them uh, about his salvation experience. He tells them about the faith of Jesus Christ. He tells Agrippa about how that the Jews are trying to kill him and persecute him and why. And so that, that's essentially what takes place in, in this, this chapter. And so what we've been doing is we've been working through pretty slowly and we've been looking for two things. One, we're drawing advice from a wonderful soul winner. Have you ever been soul winning with someone who's been soul winning for a number of years? I have. I've had the privilege to, to go, go door knocking or, or, or go out and, and hear people who are older than me, who, who've been serving God longer, who've witnessed to more people, get to hear them witness to someone. And that has been, I mean, just in, that has been so valuable to me to get to, to see it, to hear it. This is what it sounds like. This is what it looks like. And I learned so much from those. But what we're able to do tonight is for you, you and I are able to essentially be a soul winning buddy uh, with the Apostle Paul, to see him in this situation where he is before someone who is lost and that person is asking him essentially to give a reason of the faith that's in him and Paul being ready to give an answer uh, to every man that asketh of him a reason of the faith, he, he begins to tell him about Jesus, to tell him his own salvation testimony uh, and, and, and so, so we're looking at it from that aspect. We're drawing advice from a master soul winner. Does that make sense? We're drawing advice from a master soul winner. On the other part, we're praising the Lord because so many truths about Paul's salvation are all true of our salvation, right? Jude talks about the common salvation. The same thing that Paul got when he got saved is the same thing that I got when I got saved. And so as we hear Paul talk about his salvation experience, we're rejoicing in the fact that all of these things that were true of his salvation and his testimony are true of our testimony as well. Amen? And so this is point number, tonight we're going to be starting off with point number nine. 
Uh, we've already looked at eight different things. I'm not going to rehash every one of them. I'll just list a couple of them to you. We talked about the permitting of his testimony where he's given an opportunity. You and I are, are often given opportunities to witness, right? Paul takes advantage of them, so should we. We talked about the past of Paul's testimony where he talks about uh, all the things that he did uh, from his youth. He talks about from the manner of life from his youth. He talks about doing things that were contrary to the name of Christ. He talks about how that he persecuted Christians. Uh, and, and it's encouraging to me to be reminded that everybody has a past. Right? Everybody's got a past. The best Christian you know has an, has an awful, ugly, dirty past of sin. Because we're all born into sin. And so everybody has that past. And so you can either allow that past to be a hindrance or you can allow, you can allow that past to help you. Uh, to share that with others and use that testimony of what God's brought you through for His honor and glory. We talked about the person of Paul's testimony. That is obviously Jesus, where Jesus appears to him. Remember, he is on that Damascus road. He is heading with authority of the chief priest to go persecute more Christians. And, and Jesus appears to him and says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Right? And he says, who, I, who art thou, Lord? And Jesus says, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. So he had a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm thankful that I have had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. If you're saved, you've had a personal encounter with him. He has to become more than just a doctrine to you to, for you to be saved. I mean, he's got to be more than just uh, words, uh, you know, black words on white paper. I mean, Jesus Christ is not a doctrine. Jesus Christ is a person. He's someone that you get to know and that you can love and that you can have a real relationship with. He wants to be personal with you. Amen. He got personal with the Apostle Paul that day on the Damascus Road. We talked about the purpose of Paul's testimony in verse number 16. Uh, then we talked about his protection of Paul's testimony in verse 17. We talked about the power of it. Let's look in verse number 18. I told you all this is probably my favorite, my favorite verse in this chapter. Uh, verse number 18 says he's telling Paul why he saved him or what he saved him to do, what the power of his testimony is going to accomplish. He says to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. That is one powerful testimony. It has the power to open people's eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, to free them from the bondage of Satan, that they may receive an inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith. And all of the things that Paul's testimony had the power to do, your testimony has the power to do. My testimony has the power to do all of these things, to open the eyes of somebody. I said this while we were preaching through these verses, but your testimony may be the exact key that fits somebody's lock, amen, and allows that, that door to open and for that light to, cut, to shine through. It may be your exact testimony that does that for somebody else. So what do we need to do? We need to share it then. Amen? You never know which person you're going to come across might be that person that needs to hear your testimony. And so we should share our testimony every time that God gives us an opportunity. So we talked about the power of Paul's testimony. We talked about the performance of it in verse 19. Verse 19 says, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. What a statement. He said, God gave me direction, God gave me a command, and I was not disobedient. I think there have been a lot of times where I've been disobedient, right? God's given me an opportunity. He's given me the green light. He's set it up perfectly. This is a divine encounter. This is a divine interaction or appointment that God has made with me and some sinner, and I, and I was disobedient to the heavenly vision. I didn't do what I was supposed to do. I'd love to be able to say, like Paul, that I was not disobedient. Amen. So that, he talks about the performance. So he's performing it. Verse 20, uh, But show first unto them of Damascus, and at Jerusalem, and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. And then lastly, we ended up in verse 21, where the Bible says, For these causes the Jews went about, or excuse me, the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. That is the persecution of Paul's testimony. And if you and I are trying to fulfill God's will for our life, there is going to be persecution, Right? The Bible says that all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. There's always going to be opposition. Uh, this, this, this Christian life is a battlefield. Amen? It's not a playground. This, this isn't a game. This isn't a joke. This is serious, right? This is a battlefield. We're talking life and death. And I'm not talking about physical life and death. 
I'm talking about something way more important than that. Spiritual life and death. The stakes are way higher in this battle than any worldly uh, battlefield uh, that any fight or war that's taking place right now. The spiritual war is far more significant. Amen? It's, so, it's far more important. The ramifications of that war, the, the consequences of losing that war, I mean, it is, it is, way, it is imperative that we, that we stand against persecution and we don't allow that to stop our testimony and our witness for Christ. And so what, and with all that in mind, let's look in verse number 22. I want to begin to say something about the persistence of Paul's testimony. The persistence of it. Verse 22 say, it says, Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day. Let me read that again. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day. That is persistence. We can say that, right? He's saying, I continue. I, I have not stopped witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. When I read this verse, one thing that I'm, I'm reminded of and one thing that I think it'd be good for every church and every Christian to, to, to make a decision, it is that, that you've determined that you are not going to quit. You're not going to quit. I've seen a lot of people quit. Haven't you? And I've not been in this thing near as long as, as some others, right? I'm 27 years old. I got saved at 8 years old. I, I really surrendered my life and started trying to serve Jesus when I was 16 years old. I, I, you know, I've, I've not, been, not been in it near as long as some others have. But listen, I've been in this thing long enough to see people, see peers, see people that I, that I love, people that I, that I care about, just quit. Quit going to church, quit reading their Bible, throw away all standards and convictions, everything they said they used to believe, now they say they don't believe that anymore. I mean, they have quit serving God. And when I reflect on that, I, I try to think about why. Why them and why them and not me? Listen, better Christians than you have quit. Better Christians than me have quit. And there's a lot of reasons people quit. One reason I think a lot of that people do quit, some people quit because they never really were saved to begin with. Right? We were just reading uh, 3 John. John said in 1 John chapter 2, it talks about they went out from us. Uh, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. I think that happens a lot. People who make a profession of faith, they, they, for, for whatever reason, for social pressure, for, to, to, to be in the crowd, for family status. What, I, don't, I don't know what it might be. There's a lot of reasons people make uh, false professions. But, but somebody might make a false profession and, and say that they're saved, and then ultimately they quit. That's because they never really were saved, right? Jesus talks about those different kinds of soul in the Gospels, and he says that there's one that's that stony ground, which it says, for a while believe, but in time of temptation fall away. They, 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 they claim to be saved, but, but they never really were saved. I think that, that's why a lot of people quit. But I think another reason that people quit uh, is because simply they, they, get, they get backslid. They get cold on God, right? And that could happen for a number of reasons. There might be some sin in their life, that they've latched a hold to and they've determined that I'm not going to let go of this sin. I don't care what the Bible says. I don't care what the preacher says. I don't care what my parents say or whatever the case may be. I am, I am not going to let go of this sin. And so they, 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 flip, they leave the church, they get out of church, they get sideways with God because they're holding on to sin. Or maybe there's some, some difficulty in their life, right? Some tragedy, some great heartache, and they get bitter and they get angry and they, and they walk away in their relationship with God, from fellowship with God, because of that. Maybe, that, maybe that's it. I, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe there are some who are deceived by false doctrine. I've seen that happen. Haven't you? People get deceived by false doctrine. They, they, they used to believe that they could believe their Bible. <laughs> they used to believe this Bible could be believed, and now they don't believe that no more. 
they, they, they believe the lie of the, the textual criticism, the people who are trying to undermine your faith in the Word of God, they'll tell you that it's not inerrant, that it's not inspired, that it's not perfect, and they'll try to attack the Word of God. Doesn't that sound like Satan? That's exactly what he does. He tries to undermine your confidence in the Word of God. And I've seen people who, who I believe are genuinely saved. They, they've swallowed some lie. And they've been undermined. Their faith in this Bible has been undermined. And now some, the, the truths of the Word of God that we know are the fundamentals of the faith or that we know are, are significant and important to our Christian life, they've thrown them away. I've known people that have done that and you've known people that have done that. Right? The question is, why them and not me? Why them and not you? We all, we all have to fight temptation to sin. Right? Paul said that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Your flesh is just as wicked as their flesh. We all have to fight the, the, the spirit of the age. We all have principalities and powers that we're wrestling against. There are seducing spirits. There are doctrines of devils. And that's, that's something that we all have to deal with, not just them. Listen, it, tragedy befalls all of us sometimes. Amen? You're going you're gonna to lose loved ones. You have. You're, you're going to have, have, have major difficulties in your family, in your health, in your finances, whatever the case may be. There, there's going to be tragedy. There's going to be heartbreak in your life. And so, so if all the same things that we, we all fight against, all these same things, and some people quit and some people don't, uh, you know, it, it breaks my heart, and what it does is it causes me to want to draw closer to God because I realize how frail that I am, how susceptible that I am to sin, how I'm prone to wander. Lord, I feel it, and if I'm not drawing close to Him, I'm drifting away from Him. And that's a dangerous place to be. Distance between us and God, that's a dangerous thing. And so we have to be weary of it. Amen? Because it can happen to, to anybody. I want to be able to say... By the grace of God, like Paul did in our text, I continue unto this day. Doesn't matter what day it is. If, on my last day down here, I want to be able to say, I continue unto this day. You say, well, how could he do that? He did that because of his partner. Look in, in our text, look in verse 22. First he says, having therefore obtained help, of God. You're not going to be able to do it by yourself. Amen. You're not going to be able to do it alone. You're going to need to have the right partner. Paul said, the reason I've been able to continue unto this day is because I've got the right partner. I have obtained help of God. If it was up to me, I'd have quit a long time ago. And you too, right? If not for the grace of God, if not for His help, and, and this is specifically, I'm, I'm, I'm applying this specifically in context. He's talking about his ministry of evangelism and, and witnessing both the small and great and all those things, that that's what he's pursuing in, that's what he's persistent in, and he's continued to do that because he's obtained help of God. And you and I have, a, have God as our helper as well. Amen? Take your Bible with me and turn to, hold your place here, but turn to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, please. I have got to hurry. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. And uh, let's, let's look at a few verses here. I, I've, I've quoted these verses here many times, and probably, um, I guess, every chapter I, could turn, I turn to, I say it's one of my favorites, but I, I really do love 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 4 and 5. Um, but let's look here, chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 says this. It says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To, and reconciliation, you know, is it, is it is the bringing together of two opposing parties, right? Two people who are at odds. When they're reconciled, that means their differences are settled. They're, they're brought together. It's, it's making peace between two opposing parties. It says in verse 19, To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Somebody should say amen right there. Uh, not in imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So you and I as saints have received a, a word of reconciliation, a reconciling word that can cause people who are at enmity with God to make peace with God. That word is the gospel. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ 
That is the word of reconciliation. You and I have the ministry of reconciliation. And the word is the tool to accomplish the ministry. The gospel is what allows you and I to fulfill the ministry of reconciliation. When we go out and preach the gospel to this world, we're saying, be ye reconciled to God. Right? Be reconciled to God. And that's what he says in this text. Verse number 20 says, Now then, as ambassadors for Christ... As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. He says, it's as though God did beseech you by us. I'm talking about having obtained help of God, right? You can turn back to Acts chapter 26. I'm talking about having the right partner. This text says, when you go and you share the gospel with somebody else, it says, it's as though God did beseech you by us. What he's saying is that God through you, is reaching out to that lost sinner and calling them to be reconciled. He he is our partner in this thing. We're not having to do it by ourselves. We're not having to do it in our own power or in our own wisdom or in our own strength. God wants to, through you, evangelize this world. Right? God wants to, to use us to do it. God wants to help us to do it. God wants to do it through us. For this world. He is going to help you. That's a comfort. God God is going to help you to witness to others. And you and I cannot look at God and blame Him for not helping us to share the gospel or to share our testimony with this world if we don't even try to do it. God wants to do it through you, right? But if, if you... Uh, persist and if you resist what God wants to do in your life then that evangelism will not be done through you. So we cannot blame God for not helping us to evangelize if we never attempt it. What God wants you to do listen to this, all God wants you to do is try. He wants you to try. If the results are left up to Him Amen, we're not going to win them all, we're going to see that in just a minute that there's going to be times where we feel like we fail but listen, God's not asking for you to produce results God just wants you to be willing to do what he said and allow him to then do it through you. Amen? To bring the increase, to to bring the results in his own time. Matthew 28, verse number 20 says uh, there in that great commission, it says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. He says this, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. We have a great partner. Secondly, not only his partner, but also his prospects. Verse 22 again, it says, Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day. Doing what? Witnessing both to small and great. Those are his prospects. Small and great. Essentially, he's saying everybody. What he's saying is everyone is a candidate for salvation. Amen? I know I preached about that a good bit Sunday morning uh, where we're talking about God's goodwill toward men and I preached about how that it is God's goodwill for every single person to be saved. I know that's a doctrine that's under attack. There's a lot of people that don't believe that, but the Bible still teaches that. Amen? That God wants everyone to be saved. And again, I'm not going to quote all those verses that I quoted on Sunday morning, but this verse is a clear example of the fact that everyone is a candidate for salvation. Listen, you and I, witnessing the small and great, you and I need to knock doors in the trailer parks, and we need to knock doors at Converse Heights too. Amen? I mean, just everybody needs to be saved. Don't be prejudiced. Don't, don't, don't allow uh, any of your personal feelings towards somebody. Send them to hell. Because how, how many times does that happen? Well, that's not my favorite person. Well, God, God sent his son to die for them. I don't care if they're your favorite person or not. They need to be saved. Well, that guy on the job, he's a little difficult to deal with. Well, yeah, well, so are you. You need to be saved. He needs to be saved. Junk your pride. Get rid of your prejudice and share the gospel. He died for them. Amen? Small and great. We ought to witness to small and great. Their prospects for salvation. I love Luke 15, verse number 1, where it says, Then drew near him unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. Amen? He, he, wants, he wants everybody to come to him. I praise the Lord for that. So we've seen his partner, his prospects. Thirdly, in this text, we see his preaching. It says again, verse 22, Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue in this day, witnessing both the small and great. Watch what he says. Saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer 
and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. This verse, and again, I'm not going to try to belabor these things, but this verse details what it was specifically that he went about preaching. He preached, first of all, that Christ fulfilled the prophecies, right? Saying none other things than the prophets and Moses did say should come. What he's saying is Jesus Christ fulfilled the prophecies of the Old Testament, of the Messiah, of the Son of God. He, he is the Messiah. Jesus is the Christ. That's what he's saying. He's going around preaching that Christ fulfilled the prophecies. What the Old Testament required, Jesus Christ provided. Now what Jesus said, he said, I've not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Jesus Christ fulfilled every aspect of the law, every, every moral mandate of the law, uh, every, every ceremony of the law. He fulfilled all of it. Humanity had failed it. Jesus Christ, he passed the test. He, he, he fulfilled it. He provided it. And, and that's what Paul went around preaching, that Jesus Christ fulfilled the prophecy. Secondly, he preached that Jesus Christ furnished the payment. It says there in our text, he also went about preaching that Christ should suffer. Verse 23, that Christ should suffer. He went around preaching that Jesus Christ, through his suffering, had furnished the payment for our salvation. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he paid our sin debt, right? He, he, he did what was necessary. He, he, paid, he shed his own blood so that you and I could be saved. He suffered so that you and I could be redeemed. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 12 says, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. I'm glad for the blood of Jesus. Amen. Paul went around preaching that Jesus is the Messiah, that his blood saves from sin. He he also preached about the fact that Christ fixed or excuse me, that Christ finished the plan. There in our text again, in verse 23 he says and and that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead. That that is the fulfillment of our salvation, right? The Bible says that he was delivered for our offenses in the book of Romans. It says he was delivered for our offenses, but he was raised again for our justification. If Jesus Christ did not raise from the dead, you and I would be lost today. Amen? We'd be on our way to hell. But Jesus fulfilled, or he finished the plan, if you will. He rose from the dead the third day. 1 Corinthians 15, 17 says, And if Christ be not raised, ye are yet, your, it says, Your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. I'm glad I've got a Savior that's alive. Amen. And listen, by the way, th this is probably what got Paul in the most trouble. Paul goes around all, all, all the known world at that time. He's, he's preaching that Jesus Christ is alive. And, and he would go to Jerusalem and preach that Jesus Christ is alive to the same people that made sure that Christ was crucified. People hated the Apostle Paul for going around and telling people, yeah, that one that you tried to kill, he's alive today. He's God. He's the Messiah. He rose from the dead. And, and so they had a huge problem with that. But listen, and, and this world still has a problem with that. They'll tell us we're crazy. They'll believe that lie like, like talks about in the Gospels that, that people believe that the, the disciples came and stole, of his, stole his body and all these things. We know that's not true. Jesus Christ, he finished the plan. He rose from the dead just like he said he would. Amen. And, so, and then fourthly, we see that Christ fixed the partition. We're talking about the preaching of Paul. What did Paul preach? That Christ is the Messiah, his blood saves from sin, he rose from the dead. He preaches also in this text, verse, last part of verse 23. It says, and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. That's Jew, he talks about the people, we've already seen that uh, in this chapter. When he talks about the people, he's talking about the Jews. When he talks about the Gentiles, obviously he's talking about the Gentiles. What he's saying is that Jesus Christ is salvation to all men. He fixed the partition. Ephesians chapter 2 talks about that. Where he says, for he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. That's what Jesus Christ came to do. I preached a message uh, last year around Christmas time. I know y'all all remember it so well. But I preached on Simeon's prophecy uh, last year for, around Christmas time. And, and Simeon's prophecy in Luke chapter 2 was that Jesus Christ would be a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Jesus Christ came to save everybody, right? The Jews and Gentiles. So Paul was persistent. Listen, Paul didn't quit because he had the right partner, because of his prospects, also because of his preaching. He was faithful in his preaching. And listen, when I leave this world, uh, I, I want that to be able to be said of me. Amen? 
He, he, stuck with, he stayed with the Lord. He, he walked close with God. God was his partner. That, that, he, that he shared the gospel with everybody and that he was faithful to preach what this Bible says about our Savior. And listen, that, I, I would hope that would be true of all of us. That should be all of our desire. Amen? To walk with God, to witness to others, right? And, and, to, and to know what this Bible says and to share it with this world. So let's look next. Let's look in verse number 24. Let's look at the pressure on Paul's testimony. We see his persistence. Let's look next at the pressure of Paul's testimony. If you're going to try and do something for God, there's going to be people who are going to try to make you quit. Look at verse 24. It says, And thus he spake for himself, excuse me, And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself, much learning doth make thee mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and soberness. The, the reason why Paul, Festus is doing this is he is feeling the pressure of Paul's testimony. We're going to see here in just a moment. Agrippa is going to say, remember y'all know this, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. I mean, it's getting thick in that room. There's conviction settling in on everybody who's listening. And Festus, in, in, in an attempt to try to drown out what, what the preacher is saying, he says with a loud voice. Y'all see that? What he's doing, he's trying to drown out the witness of the Apostle Paul by, by saying with a loud voice. And listen, the world is going to try to drown us out. Try to drown out your witness. Try to make it so that others can't hear you as you're sharing the gospel. The best example I guess I can think of when I read this in my own personal life, we had up here in Spartanburg, I've told this before, but there was a number of years ago, they had uh, one of those, those gay pride parades up here in Spartanburg, and we went up there, and our folks from our church and a couple other churches, and we were standing on the street corner, and, and I was preaching. I was preaching on the street corner to those folks as they came by, and I believe I was, I was quoting the verse, because uh, you only have a minute. I mean, these people are walking by, and then it's the next crowd, and so you're on to the next one. But I was reading that verse, and I was talking about that verse where Jesus said, Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Right? That's the Bible. Amen? That's the Bible. Except you repent, you shall likewise perish. And I was trying to share that verse, and, and the rule was that we had to stay on the sidewalk. We could not get off the sidewalk. That's fine. We're on the sidewalk. And so I'm, I'm walking up and down this, this sidewalk, and there is a lady for, with the parade with a big bullhorn, and she's right in my face. I mean, she's almost touching my nose with this bullhorn, and she is screaming at the top of her lungs, in this bullhorn. So I'm walking up and I'm walking side to side. I'm trying to, to get away from this lady who's screaming in my face with this bullhorn. Um, but, but you know, obviously I'm on my side. She's on, she, she did that for probably 10 minutes uh, of just screaming in my face with that bullhorn. And, and what's that an example of? The fact they're going to try to drown you out. What is she doing? She's trying to make it so that no one can hear that except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. That's not a convenient message. That's not what they want to hear. What's sad is that one sinner is trying to cause all the other sinners not to hear the truth of God's Word. And that's exactly what's taking place in our text. Festus, it, it's getting thick in there. Paul's making great arguments. Paul is being persuasive. And so Festus steps up and says, hey, you're just you're crazy. He says it with a loud voice trying to drown out Paul, trying to distract uh, from the message. He's trying to deride Paul. He's trying to belittle him. He says, much learning doth make thee mad. Uh, trying to belittle him. And we live in a world of people who are going to try to belittle us for our religious beliefs. Right? For, for what this Bible... If you believe this Bible and, and, and you use the Scriptures as the foundation for your beliefs, for your thoughts, and for your opinions, this world is going to make sure that people think you're strange. Something is wrong with you. You're, you're, you're weird. And listen, if... I, I, I'd wear that as a badge of honor. Right? I, I think that's a wonderful thing. If everything you're doing is being approved and applauded by this world, something is wrong with you. Right? We live in a wicked world. And if that wicked world has no problem with you, God has a problem with you. And so I, I, I think Paul heard this, much learning doth make thee mad. And uh, he probably thought himself happy about that too because he knew he was doing something right. Amen. And, and this is also an opportunity to try to deflect. He's trying to, to uh, 
you know, the Bible talks in John chapter 3 about how that men love darkness rather than light and they don't want to come to the light lest their deeds be reproved. The light that Paul's shining in this place is getting a little too bright and so Festus is trying to deflect from that. Um, and so all of these are tactics that the enemy will try to use as you and I share our testimony with others. Lastly, let's look in verse number 26. Verse 26. Thank y'all for not saying amen when I said lastly. That's very good. That's, y'all are sweet. Y'all are very sweet. Verse 26, we're going to see something about the, the persuasion of Paul's testimony. Verse 26 begins with an invitation. Look in verse 26 again. He says, For the thing, for, excuse me, for the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Again, we're looking at this passage and we're drawing tips uh, of advice and, and evangelism and witnessing. And in these two verses, there's a lot of very good practical advice to draw. He acknowledges the understanding of King Agrippa there in the verse 26. He says, for the king knoweth these things. Essentially what he's doing is he is he's, he's giving a conclusion. And he's kind of wrapping it up. He's trying to land the plane. And in doing so, that's almost a statement of review. He's saying, all right, now all the things I said, the king knows these things. He's acknowledging the understanding of the king. All right, he's, he's simplifying these truths. And what this does is it sets up a logical progression and it helps boil down the conversation to important facts. And so there, he's acknowledging his understanding. He is asserting confidently. He uses that phrase, I am persuaded. Listen, you, you are not going to believe someone who does not believe what they're telling you. You, you want somebody in sales, if you're in sales, I know this is maybe a crude comparison or illustration, but that's all right. If you're in sales and you're trying to, to sell a product, you better believe that you've got the best product. Amen? Because if you don't believe it, that's going to come through in your presentation. They're not going to believe it. You have to know what you believe. You have to know what it is that you are offering people and be persuaded that it is something worth having. And Paul says, I am persuaded. Paul knows the salvation that he experienced is wonderful. And so he's persuaded of that. And he's trying to persuade the Apostle Paul. And, and the, re the fact that he is asserting confidently, that's a big reason as to why his gospel presentation was so persuasive. Listen, when you and I are sharing the gospel, there is no reason, no reason to hang your head. Right? There's no reason to apologize. There, there, there's no reason to try to soft pedal it or try to try to make it more palatable. Listen, it's the truth of God. And you and I can can we we believe that. And so that belief should give us some boldness to be assertive in what we're saying. Does that make sense? Paul is giving us a wonderful example of that. He asserts confidently. He also aims personally. He uses the name King Agrippa. Uh, he, he uses that in talking to King Agrippa. He uses his name. And, and what that's doing is that's making it more personal, right? He is aiming personally. If I'm having a conversation with someone and then all of a sudden I, I use their name in, in continuance of that conversation, it, it brings a heightened awareness, right? There's more of a sensitivity. There's more uh, attention that's being paid. And so simply, again, that's just a little nugget, just a little practical advice, but that's what Paul does here. He uses that person's name as he's sharing the gospel with them, making it a more intimate encounter. And then he asks questions. He, he says, believest thou the prophets? Right? It's almost like he's, as he's giving this presentation of who Jesus is and, and what the Bible says, he's asking these questions. Do you believe? Do you believe the prophets? Um, and, and one thing I, I love about this invitation in this text, some people, when they're soul winning, when they're witnessing to people, they're afraid to ever attempt to bring someone to a point of decision. Y'all ever felt that? Where, where you're witnessing to somebody, maybe you tell them the gospel, you tell them what Jesus did, but you never come to a point of invitation uh, where you, you invite them to trust the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and Paul is doing that in this text, right? He's asking him, do you believe? Will you believe? And so he's desiring to see him, him saved. He gives him a personal invitation. But not only that, lastly, we see an insufficiency. We see an invitation, verse 26 and 27. Sadly, uh, we see an insufficiency in verse 28 and 29. Verse 28 says this, Then Agrippa, 
said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all them that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. That, that, is, a, that is a sad confession in verse 28. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Now, I don't know the, the or, or King Agrippa's life historically. I'm not sure what may have followed this. But as far as we can tell, Agrippa died and went to hell. He came to a point where he almost became a Christian, and yet he decided to go to hell instead. Isn't that sad? Here's the sad truth. happens every day happens every day. It, it, it could be happening tonight. You're here, you are not saved, and you're at a point where maybe you're, you're feeling persuaded and, and there's a drawing and the Holy Spirit is letting you know where you stand with God and you'll leave here as an almost Christian. Almost Christians go to hell. Right? Paul said in his response, so he, he gives this very sad... And, and Paul had heard that kind of thing before. This is something Paul's used to. Actually, you're in Acts 26. Look in Acts 24. Look in Acts 24. In verse 24, we see a, a pretty similar statement. This is Felix. He's having that conversation with, I told you about, verse, in chapter 24. Verse, look at 24. Chapter 24, verse 24. It says, And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And I would imagine that Paul probably gave a very similar presentation that he did uh, to Agrippa. It says in verse 25, And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. We're back in chapter 26. Felix hears the truth of righteousness and, and temperance and judgment to come, and he's convicted, and he, like King Agrippa, rather than receive the truth, he pushes it off. He says, I'll, I'll call for you when I have a convenient season. When it's convenient for me to get saved, that's when I'll get saved. Look, you're not promised tomorrow. Amen? And there's no time like the present. Isn't that what they say? There's no time like the present. The, the past is gone. The future is an illusion. You, it may never come. You may never get there. All you've got is right now. You better trust Him today. Amen? You better trust Him right now if you're not saved. Don't do like Felix did and say, a convenient season. Don't do like, like Agrippa did and say, well, almost. You need to trust the Lord and be saved. Amen? We see a sad confession, and then lastly, in verse 29, there is a sincere concern or, or consternation. Verse 29, he says, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. What's amazing is that, and I'm done, Paul standing there, they're, they're trying to kill him, He's, his life is on the line, and, and if you looked at that situation, you looked at King Agrippa, uh, on his throne, sitting in judgment with, with, with luxury and a life of ease and all those things, and you looked at Paul in shackles and in bonds, being persecuted, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to kill him. If you looked at those two people and you had to ask the question, which one would you rather be? Paul's saying, the better one to be would be me, not you. He says, I wish that, that you and everybody else here were just like, were, were as I am, except these bonds said, I wish you were like me, saved, just not in bondage like I am. Almost a little, a little comic relief there at the end where he says, accept these bonds. But what he's saying is, Paul understands that, that Agrippa is the one to be pitied in this situation, not him. Isn't that amazing? Paul can look at King Agrippa and have pity on him and know I'm in a way better position than you are because I'm saved by the grace of God. Listen, I, it doesn't matter the, the positions or the status of people in, of it, in this world. If you're saved, you've got it really good. Amen? 
It doesn't matter what you're facing, what difficulty you have. We can rejoice in the fact that if we're born again, we're in an ideal situation, in an ideal position because we're in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. My prayer is, as we went through this chapter, number one, again, that you will see the, the, the wisdom and, and the way in which Paul presented his faith and, and take instruction from that and advice from that. But secondly, let's just thank God that we're saved and that the testimony of Paul is our testimony uh, if you've trusted Christ. Amen. If you're not saved, I implore you, get saved. Trust the Lord today. But if you're not saved, I'd ask you this. When's the last time that you told, or if you are saved, uh, when's the last time you told somebody else? Amen. When's the last time you told somebody else how to be saved? You told them about your salvation experience or that you thanked God that you are saved? Amen. There's a lot, a lot of truths to respond to tonight, all right?